Welcome to the 11th episode of Season 5 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Tuesday the 31st of July, 2012, and in this episode we're going to talk about the O'Reilly Open Source Convention and interview Jonathan Nadow about the Accessible Computing Foundation. We will, of course, cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, tomorrow's technology today, go over your feedback and recap our current competition. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm stunt Laura Andy Piper, hmm. and with me this week are the very real Tony Whitmore. Hello. The stunt Alan, Alan Bell. Hello. And the sometimes real Mark Johnson. Hello. Sometimes surreal as well. Yes. <laughs> Let's be fair to Alan. Alan is an Alan in his own right. I am. He's yes. a stunt Alan, but also an actual Alan. Yes. yes. I, I'm, a, I'm merely an imposter here. I'm an Alan Definitely. in reality. <laughs> A place I like to visit sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Right, okay, so we have a full house, albeit with some different faces. It's nice to see you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you for stepping into the various shoes and boots. Um, (laughs) Mark, what have you been doing since the last episode? I've been playing with my new toy. Which is? It's a Nexus 7. What's that? It's a 7-inch tablet from Google slash Asus. Wow. Is that it in your hand? It is it in my hand. That is an impressive... Like the way he's impressive, he's, he's using it as kind of his prompt. He's, he's, look, he's sitting here, for those of you in, in, out there in podcast radio land, Mark is sat here with, you know, the rest of us have laptops and show notes and things in front of us, but Mark just has his very nice little seven-inch tablet. Exactly. It's fondle slab. Yes. I'm fondling it gently. Okay, that leaves your other hand free to drink tea. <laughs> yes, that's right. Excellent. Good. Alan. Yes. Pretending that you're... Alan, yes, right. what have you done <laughs> since the last episode? Well, well I, I'm going to pretend that I'm this Alan. Um, so I've been, I've been having fun. I've, I, I went to the Olympics opening ceremony. Oh, really? Well, you were actually there? Well, kind of. Um, I was there on the Wednesday before, oh, before everyone else. You got the preview, and yeah, then you weren't allowed to tell anyone what you'd seen. I had to save the secret. Yes. It was the big, big save the secret, secret oh, hashtag. Very but, good. Um, if you could have told one secret from the show, which would it have been? Uh, if they said to you, go on, you let one out. That, that one one secret out? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Um, I have to think about that because there was so okay. much in it. Uh, there was helicopters and queens jumping out of them, but they didn't actually jump. The queen didn't jump out on the on the Wednesday. Oh. Um, she saved that for the for the Friday. <laughs> well, she's the knocking on a bit now, isn't she? Overhead, overhead. <laughs> that was all jolly good fun. Excellent. Andy? Yes, I've had a very Ubuntu-y kind of a, a couple of weeks, actually. Cool. Um, since, well, since the last show that I was here, I've done lots of other things <laughs> as well. But um, I went to the O'Reilly, O'Reilly Open Source Convention, which we'll talk about in a bit. I went to um, the first UK OpenStack user group, which was hosted by Canonical. Uh-huh. And uh, our very own uh, UPC uh Former host Davey was there. Oh, really? Uh, he was. Uh, he actually did the overview presentation of OpenStack, which was very cool. Cool. Um, what else? I've got an, a Raspberry Pi now. Hurrah! Finally, oh, one right. of the last people Ooh. in the world. In the world? No, that's not true. But I, I have got one, and it has a. It comes in a nice. Well, it didn't come in. I built a Lego case out of a kit oh, really? that I got, which is very cool. Uh, and uh, of actual um, Lego, of actual Lego that right. was actually designed by a a, um, a scout, I think, a twelve year old scout or something. Mm. It's a cool web uh, blog post about it on the Raspberry Pi blog, and now they they sell them from a particular retailer or, or online retailer. Cool. It's not that easy to put the case together, but it's really really cool that it's in a little red red Lego case with a, mm, with nice. a raspberry on top. Uh, and I went to the very very nice Ubuntu UK barbecue with you, Tony. In fact, yes, <laughs> at my house, which is at <laughs> Alan's house, where we did things with his chickens. Uh, oh. <laughs> trying to balance them on have done. John Faulkley's head. Yes. <laughs> that was good fun. Yeah, it didn't go quite so well and, with John. But <laughs> and Alan Pope got quite frustrated trying to fix various laptops, I seem to remember. Yeah. There were laptops in bits. It was quite um, an interesting event because this, this was an event that was advertised with the Google Plus event management service thing. Yes. Which... Um, you managed to invite. They had some teething problems with that because, <laughs> you know, when I post things on Google Plus, I generally post them to ex- circles and extended circles, and I thought that that was the, the the done thing with events as well, and it sort of invited <laughs> all of Silicon Valley to my back garden. Right, <laughs> but but to be fair, Linus didn't turn up. Linus didn't turn up. No. Yeah, they wouldn't quite. Sent his apologies. They wouldn't <laughs> quite have fitted. I don't think. Not all of Silicon Valley. I mean, you've got a big garden, but still. Yeah. Well. It's- it was good fun. It was very good it was fun. Very nice. Thank, thank you, you very for much. having the motley assorted Ubuntu UK people around. And uh, I came away with just as much food as I turned up with. So it was, <laughs> a, it was a good deal for me. 
Um, but yes, so I did that, and uh, I also had a nice weekend in London with an old couple of old school friends of mine. Um, I keep, should, should call them old school friends, friends of mine from school who are <laughs> the same age as me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I went to see the Reduced Shakespeare Company show, which is on in London for the next few weeks. So go and see that. It's all about sports, but you don't need to know about sports to get the jokes. Very funny. Is um, it also about Shakespeare? This one, no. Oh. Yeah. Their first show was about Shakespeare, and now they've done other things. So ah, the first show they did, they do the complete works of Shakespeare in, in I think, ninety six yeah. minutes or something like that. Um, and they've done other things about the history of America, all the great books, Hollywood, all the great oh, films, all that sort cool. of stuff. And this one is about mm. all the sports. Basically, it's three idiots um, <laughs> trying to tell you about every single sport in history ever in two hours. Right. So yeah, that's the concept. Mm. But we did want to remind you of our uh, competition we've got going on at the moment, which is to win an Eco PC. We reviewed it back in episode six of this season. So go and listen to that for the review. It's an Eco PC N1A with a 300 gig hard disk, 2 gig of RAM and a 1.6 gig Atom CPU. Um, the question we have set is what does the evot.biz website say the power consumption of the N1A is? Um, send your entries to competition at ubuntu-uk.org. Uh, by Monday the 13th of August and we'll announce the winner in our next episode um, and make sure you tell us what you'll do with it as well if you win it the ever-present question on that one you can also get details of all the vouchers that we had last time um, on our last show on our last episode we are not going to read them again thank you very much oh come on the codes are so good they're <laughs> yeah. really, really really memorable as well if I read one out now then the people will just be immediately remembering them tomorrow morning when they go to the website or switching off and not listening to the rest of the show <laughs> yes so you've got about two weeks to use those up but they're discounts for various uh, values and upgrades and things so go back and listen to the last episode um, to hear what they were right I think we've covered all the administrative here shall we get on with the show Let's do that. Let's Go do it. Man. Andy. Hiya. <laughs> oh, sorry. That hey, was I'm, spooky. Sorry. Sorry. That was quite disturbing. Uh, you went oh, to yeah, OSCON. The word. I went to OSCON. What happened to OSCON? Um... So for people who don't know what OSCON is, um, I was really excited because I've been in kind of open source communities pretty much since OSCON started back in 1999. Um, so OSCON is the O'Reilly Open Source Convention. So O'Reilly, the people, O'Reilly, oh, really, are the people that, that publish the books with the animals on the cover. And they're, they're kind of, you know, very often very good reference works for open source kind of um, And they're sponsoring stuff. the Geek Nick at Ogg Camp. More they sponsor later. all kinds of cool stuff. And they've, they've sponsored lots of things at Ogg Gog- Camp's past as well so um they're very lovely people Hmm. um so uh so anyway it's it's a big convention it was in portland in oregon um it ran for a week and uh, lots of cool stuff happened so what happened is i think a few years ago um some guy called jono um i can't remember don't know exactly who he is but he he started some jacon wasn't it yeah something like that and he started some community community (laughs) (laughs) he started some community leadership summit which runs the the saturday and the sunday before the convention and unfortunately i was traveling at the time so i missed that some of my colleagues went and that was meant to be very good so it was an unconference around how how you do community leadership and how you can kind of get people more involved in different communities um but you know the the overall event was is five days of different tracks there's a big expo hall with lots of vendors so i was actually there um, in my professional capacity um to um, man one of the stands in the expo hall to talk about clouds oh, cool. um but i also did some um some birds of a feather and went to some talks and things cool okay so you were there talking about Cloud Foundry, is that right? I was, yes. So that I'm, my my ne- my job now, um, having moved on from my previous employer, is developer advocate for Cloud Foundry, which is an open source platform as a service. There are other platforms as a service available, <laughs> which uh, we might mention in a moment. What's a platform <laughs> as a service? Okay, so platform as a service. So think about clouds. Um, we often divide them up into layers. And so we often talk about infrastructure Can as a service. Nimbus, that sort of thing? Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. So, so And they've, they've all got kind of funky things to do with, you know, cloud, so silver things and you know, nebulas and stuff. Anyway, no, um, <laughs> infrastructure as a service is kind of like, if you like the hardware, if you're going to buy a computer and you yeah. just get a bit of, uh, literally a bit of electronics, which has probably got some disks and some CPU and stuff. Mm. So that's what we call infrastructure as a service. And it's typically, you refer to things like Amazon EC2 as an infrastructure, right? because what it lets you do is have a, have a container and then you go and put an operating system in it. Mm-hmm. So the next layer up is kind of platform as a service where you actually imagine you've got a computer with an operating system on it and then now you can write apps right or you don't need to set all the stuff up 
to write the apps, you don't need your Apache web server in your, or your Nginx or your Java runtime, whatever. You, you, you've just got all that there for you in the cloud. So that's what the platform is. So the platform as a service lets you just write apps and deploy them. And then the next layer up typically is software as a service. So something like Gmail or um, Google Docs or um, salesforce.com where you've mm-hmm. got a, a web app that you're using. So oh, yeah. that's what that's that's what I mean. That's what we mean by platform. So actually we were there talking about that and um, there were other companies talking about platforms and infrastructure. So there was the people from the OpenStack project that had a whole day devoted to OpenStack, which is an open source infrastructure as a, as a, as a service. Yeah. And... Um, which kind of competes with Amazon, but it's open, so we like it and it's cool. Uh, and uh, also Red Hat have got a new project called OpenShift, which is kind of similar to Cloud Foundry, but runs on kind of exclusively on Red Hat as a as virtualization. So, Okay, cool. So was the cloud a big part of OSCON then? It was really big. And I think part of it was because HP were one of the sponsors and HP are talking about their cloud, which is actually based on OpenStack, which is very nice. Oh, right. Um, and it's just a hot topic at the moment. Hot topic, sorry. <laughs> um <laughs> So uh, I think that was, you know, people are getting to the point where lots of open source software is just is suitably consumable and you mm. just want to start building new cool stuff in the web, in the in the cloud. So from your mobile devices, Mark might want to access some cool thing from his lovely new Fondle slab, um, which is just running in the, in the cloud. So mm-hmm. um, we, we want to help do that. So and also uh, from an Ubuntu perspective or a canonical perspective, they were talking about some very, very cool stuff. So. Um, George Castro and Mark Mims did a great talk about something called Juju, mm-hmm. which is part of the canonical portfolio, which lets uh, you really quickly um, set up kind of packaged applications, let's say WordPress, mm. and you need a MySQL server and you need a load of other bits and pieces. Uh, and you want to do that in a nice big distributed way so you can run a couple of commands um, called Juju t- Charms and, and have all these things deployed. So that was really neat. Cool. Yeah, I think we talked to George Earlier this season, last time think, Alan was on the show. In fact, I think you did. Was indeed. it? Oh, right. Okay. It was nice to nice to meet him because um yeah I, I know he's a friend of the show and I've I've heard him on on the podcast before. So George is a, a really good really good guy. Uh, yep. that's, uh, yeah, that's that's just because I get emails going. Oh, you're so kiss ass to Canal. <laughs> but no, he is. He's a really nice guy, George. <laughs> we can't help it if they employ nice people. Exactly. Just, yeah. Well, they don't well, always. But, you know. And the other <laughs> yeah that Alan Pope. Yeah. <laughs> Talking of let, let, let's just um, make sure that we don't give you know Canonical all the love. Uh, one of the big sponsors of the event, um, in fact, the biggest sponsor of the event was um, a little company called Microsoft, which was really interesting for an open oh, source. Oh, I've heard of them. Yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't. Well, it was Microsoft, but um, they've Microsoft have actually set up for those who don't know a, a new spin off called Microsoft oh, yes. open, open Technologies, Technologies Incorporated. Yes. So they had a huge big Multi. presence. Um, I don't think they had any talks, but they had um, a really big um, section in the expo hall with a big touchscreen computer with Windows 8 and lots of cool stuff. But they do actually have now... nice open technologies being demoed there. That's right. But they do actually have now, um, via their Coplex website, the ability to host open source projects. And they had a bunch Mm. of um, developers who had written... There's a guy who's written a package manager for Windows and various other things, and they're contributing to some some big open source projects now. So, so you can and get update your Windows. Uh, yeah, kind of. It, I can't remember the name of the command, but it's something like that. Oh, yeah. It's okay. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm sure they'd be happy to help you get it on there, Alan. So anyway, yeah. And uh, Mark Shuttleworth was there as well, wasn't he? Uh, I think he was. Yeah, no, he was. He, he, did, the, he did the closing <laughs> keynote. Uh, he was one of. The, so each morning. Um, Tuesday through Thursday, they had um, three or four keynote speakers. Right. Um, so kind of the big names and the ones, I mean, they were all excellent. They were all really, really good speakers. I mean, the the overall conference schedule was just superb. Um, but the kind of the big speakers, we had Tim O'Reilly, who was talking a lot about economics of open source and sharing in companies, um, putting their stuff out in the open and uh, giving back to the community. We had a friend of the show, Simon Phipps, uh, oh, talking yes. about the fact that uh, – the OSI, which he's now the president of, is has now got the ability to join as an individual member. Yes. So oh, right. go and join as an individual member, everybody. I have. It's awesome. We like them. What do you get? You get a T-shirt. Get an email address. <laughs> I got a T-shirt. I'm not wearing it tonight. Ooh. But uh, yeah, no. In fact, I'm I think... wearing another T-shirt, just to be you clear. Are, yes. Um, <laughs> Simon, Simon is going to be at Og Camp again. Oh, very and, good. And uh, I think he might be... Um, Giving helping it. people join there as well very good <laughs> and, assisting uh, um, them filling in the form and, this, <laughs> and yeah and this other chap called mark shuttleworth did a big he actually he did a great talk mark did he he actually had mm. a really limited amount of time um to, to talk about lots of cool stuff that canonical are doing mm-hmm. um he was pretty honest about the original the initial um reception of unity and in, in the community <laughs> uh, which was quite interesting okay. but also how it's now evolved and all the cool stuff you can do with it so cool. um that was good Right. But he started off really uh, by talking about 
uh, clouds all by the way all the videos are on youtube and i'll make sure they're linked from the, the show notes mm -hmm. um, yeah so he did a, a talk i think it was called um magic from the cloud or something along those lines um and he demoed he used juju which is the the charm thing for kind of server or cloud administration mm. he deployed a an app called subway which is a kind of an in the cloud irc client that runs in your web browser right to amazon ec2 running ubuntu um had it running there and then said oh my goodness you know a tornado is about to hit our data center or whatever um we, we, we need to plan for this so he said let's move these the these running instance of subway across to another data center on the other coast of the us for example um oh but that data center is not running amazon ec2 it's running hp and uh, with an open stack infrastructure so he used juju to do that so that was kind of the first moment in the talk where people kind of went "Ooh, that's kind of cool <laughs> So was the, the sessions carried across and everything? It was a seamless migration, or was there? Know, a... I'm not going to say that that was the case because I can't remember. I was so right. blown away by the general, you know, let's take fr literally from a, a, a running system and move it the whole thing to a clean system. I mean, there was nothing right. provisioned in the open stack, so I can't remember whether sessions went across. But certainly, the infrastructure moved over, and you, you know, you could continue to do stuff. Um, it was all sort of um, there was a big. Uh, diagram with sort of uh, springs so, sort of showing the various hosts in the infrastructure yeah because it, it wasn't just all running on one machine it's running on uh, that's right yeah know, so it's, the, the point of machines. juju is oh, okay. not and I, th and I think again this is what george talked or, or somebody talked about on, on the show before but the point of juju is that you you're not deploying you know a a small app on a small mm -hmm. desktop pc you're deploying a distributed set of components on a set of servers in the yeah. cloud yeah so that was kind okay. of okay um, the other thing he then went on to show was kind of what they're doing on the desktop. And actually, this was their big reveal um, of, of the week because it, they then subsequently blogged about cool new stuff coming in Ubuntu. Yeah. Um, so earlier on in the demo, if you guys go and uh, listeners go and watch the video on YouTube uh, um, later, um, he popped a few things up in Unity and, and he'd gone to a website and this little telltale banner had appeared saying do you want to integrate gmail into your ubuntu desktop and i kind of at that time kind of thought oh that's interesting i haven't seen that before mm. and he went on to show that they've now got they're now integrating web apps into the ubuntu desktop into unity which is really really cool so he went to for example gmail and said well you know we've got this web app gmail but we kind of like you know desktop indicators to appear when uh, when new mail arrives mm. yeah and we'd like them to actually appear in the indicator menu rather than you know um, on the browser tab, for example. Um, oh, and we might want to send an email using the HUD. So I remember I was deeply skeptical of the HUD concept when they first started talking about it, this idea of scooping up everything from all the application mm. menus and just presenting it in a kind of searchable text box. Um, and it just worked. You know, he said, well, let's create a new email, bring up the HUD type, you know, send message, and it pops up an actual Gmail web browser. Um now, he, Mark didn't show this, but I was talking to uh, to uh, a couple of Canonical employees afterwards, and, and they were kind of saying, well, it goes further than that. You can take, for example, Last.fm or, you know, a music app and have that integrated oh, yeah, into the sound, the sound menu, menu. Yeah. Um, as, yeah, as another alternative player. So it looks really, really neat and smart. I think yeah. it's coming in, 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 in 12.10. Yeah, you can get a, a PPA for it on 12.04 as well. That's right, yeah. So I know that they're very keen, obviously, that we should... Uh, everyone should try this out so yeah. the idea is really having standalone web apps that have having their own um, icon in the um in the launcher mm. um and yeah I mean, it's one thing to have apps that launch right. essentially a website right something else to have the integration with menus and yeah and, and notifications and, and yeah everything and the hard i mean that was really great i mean you can actually yes, just that you is know, impressive yeah. what do i want to do i want to send an email and i want my email client to be a, a gmail web um window mm. so I was very, very, very impressed with that. And the other thing is you can, because basically the way it works is by um, user scripts, which is where you write a little bit of JavaScript, which runs when you go to a particular website. So if you've got a website which you'd like to integrate with Ubuntu, you can write your own user script for that website and use the Unity APIs, which is quite clever. You could also um, adapt uh, open source projects like yes, of course. WordPress. Yes. You know, that it could be built into WordPress. Mm. And so you go to the your admin console of your WordPress yeah. and yeah. have that right. integrated. Mm. Oh, okay. Useful. Yeah. So it was a good week. Was it a week? Uh, it was a week. It was really great. I mean, it's one of, as I say, it's one of those things I've aspired to go to for a long time. I'm very fortunate to be in a position now where I'm working for an organization that was able to send me. Because uh, it's not cheap. 
It's not. Um, and it, but having said that, it's been going for you know twelve or thirteen years, and they did as they often do at these kind of conferences a show of hands who's who's been to everyone who's who's mm. been here more than five times who's who's Stand the first up time who came the, yeah. the furthest <laughs> and and Stanley and all that kind of thing and and and, and it, it seems to be a really you know healthy environment where people you know you've got a, a large number of people who've been the the ones who've come come every year and we've we've also yeah. got a, a large pool of people who are brand new to it and you know it wasn't all um although it was in on, on the west coast of the u.s it wasn't all um people from the u.s so no, it good. was it was really good i really enjoyed it um I, I feel very privileged to have been and it was great fun to see what's happening in in with lots of organizations the other nice thing i'll just mention is in the expo hall they don't just have uh big companies um mm-hmm. although they have a number of big companies and the sponsors they also have um along the back wall this year they had a lot of non-profits so for example the osi was one of those mm-hmm. um but you had um you know uh organizations like coding for america social coding for good um lots of other um organizations like that local groups um uh, groups dedicated to getting kids or um or maybe um, getting more women into technology or whatever locally so it was it was really interesting to see that that mixture so enjoyable cool. excellent okay well thank you for that little uh Roundup of Oscon. Um, are you going to blog about it at all, or anything? Uh, like that? Do you know? I really must, and I will. In fact, that you forced my hand. I, I, I'll have to do it. I, I'm just so far behind with with uh, blogging. But yes, okay, I shall blog about it, Tony. Yes. Okay. By tomorrow, please. Um, <laughs> excellent. Well, thank you for that. And now the news. Microsoft have fixed an embarrassing label or a constant in some of their code relating to Linux virtualization. And this can this was uh, spotted by Matthew Garrett or fixed by Matthew Garrett in fact. It contained the constant B16B00B5 uh, which looks an awful lot like the phrase big boobs. That's Matthew titter, Garrett. Titter. Yeah, well, a, bit, a bit puerile really. <laughs> um, and as Matthew Garrett pointed out this isn't really the sort of thing that we want in our code and it's the real story here is the the origin of it it's it's come from microsoft um and it's to support um virtualization of windows and it's quite hard to fix because we think this this constant is hard coded into microsoft's hyper v cloud platform ah um <laughs> <laughs> and it probably has to match that to work mm. and uh, it, it's it, you know it's puerile it's not horrific um there's probably a lot worse in the linux source code itself i'm sure there is but it's (laughs) it's fascinating that the source of this is some closed and proprietary um code where this constant originates and it's um it's not something that users would ever see is it it's it's hidden away in source code it's deep in the code okay so not good but not the end of the world yeah and it's it's just an interesting process where the the many eyes shining a light on this uh yes didn't shine it on until it was too late. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe Newell of Valve has revealed that a factor in the decision to port Steam to Linux is the belief that Windows 8 will be a catastrophe for everyone in the PC space, describing the port as a hedging strategy. Meanwhile, Rich G- Gildrich of Valve will be demonstrating Left 4 Dead 2 on Linux during the OpenGL boff at the SIGGRAPH conference in Los Angeles. Okay. So somebody doesn't think Windows 8 is going to be very good. Yeah. Has anybody else said anything about Valve recently and Steam and stuff? Of uh, course. Didn't Richard I hear, Stallman. Didn't I hear yeah. Richard Stallman saying something about it being unethical yeah. or something? I think, I think he actually he actually wrote that just before it was officially announced. Oh, when, okay. when it was, you know, strong rumours on Pharonix. Right. Um, so he's been around a while. But he doesn't say, as you'd ex- he doesn't say the kind of thing which you'd expect, which is, oh, it's, you know the end of the world how could that possibly happen he actually says well in a way it's good because it means that if people want to play games they don't have to have all of the additional removal of their freedom that windows would provide Mm. they can run a gnu slash linux system but then he says drm bad proprietary software bad etc as you as you it's consistent yes (laughs) that's what we expect Google security engineer Tavis Ormandy posted to information in the full disco- disclosure security mailing list regarding Ubisoft's Uplay DRM system on a potential security hole on the customer systems by way of a rootkit. His initial investigations suggest that the Uplay system could allow arbitrary code execution from the web. 
Ubisoft, or Ubisoft perhaps, responded to the claims by stating that Uplay never contained a root, a root kit, the floor has, uh, and the floor has been patched, and we have always been at war with Eurasia, or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's an interesting one, mm. uh, you know, because this is a, you know, a DRM system similar to, uh, to Steam. That you have to, that you have to, you know, right. register online to be able to play the games that you paid for, and it's, uh, you know, a risk of exposing users to some fairly horrible security holes. Hmm. Assuming that's all they are. Yeah. Right. UK retailer and uh, worldwide retailer Tesco has come under fire from the online community over its insecure storage of users' passwords. Users reported on Twitter that when sending a lost password request, a Tesco employee would email their password back in plain text. Tesco responded to the reports by stating that they take security and data protection very seriously, prompting a series of blog posts outlining where they're going wrong with their security. So actually, this was a a chap called Troy Hunt, who's actually an Australian researcher who... um, observed that I think that uh, that he'd been emailed a Tesco online password in plain text and he mm. I actually saw this happening in real time on Twitter he he tweeted to the Tesco customer care people who to be honest are probably just you know the literally the people who are trying to make sure that um people you know that, like, that an old beans, lady may, yeah. you know doesn't get too upset at the store or whatever oh, actually be fair an old lady probably isn't on Twitter but anyway you know if, if there's if there's a customer <laughs> oh, care I, no, I, 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 I think mean you'll find there's the... a big silver surfer community in Identica full of right. old ladies yes okay <laughs> <laughs> is that fab one of them no <laughs> um, you said that I did yes um no, I mean, it was quite interesting because they, they just responded and said, well, we follow the, the strictest security standards and uh, yeah. the passwords are only in plain text when we paste we them into the email, email which, yeah. uh, which is, just isn't good enough because it mm. means that anyone inside the retailer has potentially the ability yeah. to, to, to look at that. So he's also then gone through and discovered that they run on a really old back-level version of Microsoft IIS web server and various other things. And, and also the fact that this has been reported over a number of years now, it's just beginning yeah. to kind of get elevated up to... Some of the more mainstream, at least tech press, like Gizmodo. Um, did I just say Gizmodo's yeah. mainstream tech press? Um, there is actually a, a tumble log if people are interested in uh, tracking these things called plaintextoffenders.com, where people regularly post uh, offending websites that keep mm-hmm. the, these uh, information in plain text. Fair enough. Okay, and that's the end of the news. And what's the event that everybody's talking about? Is it OSCON? <laughs> Olympics. Oh yeah, begins with an O. It does begin with an O. It's the Og Olympics. Oh, I oh, wanted oh, to I like call it that, that, but nobody else would. Like I don't that. think um, that's actually allowed under low cog rules. You mean, this show <laughs> may be taken off air. Oh, <laughs> uh, right. Yes. So Og Camp is two and a little bit weeks away. Mm-hmm. The next show will be the Tuesday before Og Camp. Uh, it's happening in Liverpool on the eighteenth and nineteenth of August. Mm. Um, so, there's lots going on, and I'll just quickly run through it all so that you don't miss any of it. Cool. Uh, first of all, thank you to our sponsors, Liverpool John Moore University, who are hosting us, uh, Bitemark, who have given us some money, O'Reilly, Yar Riley, who are sponsoring the Geek Nick, and Canonical, who have given us some stuff for the raffle. That's good to see those. Some of those names come back year after year, yeah. don't they? That's good to have them with us. Thank you. Um, in fact, I think all of those people have sponsored us before, except for LJMU. Uh, in fact, LJM, you did sponsor the last one in Liverpool. Oh, well, there we go. Um, right, the tracks. I've mentioned before that there's going to be some scheduled tracks and some unscheduled tracks where you can come along and offer up your talks. Uh, on the scheduled track, we're going to have uh, Ross Gardler of Open Directive, Alan, uh, there, sorry. Alan O'Donoghue of uh, Hack to the Future fame, uh, Alex Martindale, who's going to be talking about a uh, history of, of computer errors, Lindsay Anderson from the... Um, Broadband for the Rural North Project, Stephen Fry from the telly and stuff, uh, and Simon Phipps from uh, the Open Rights Group. He's going to be talking on behalf of uh, on the scheduled track. Oh, okay. Um, as well as that, we've got the Open Hardware Jam, where there's going to be all sorts of workshops and uh, and talks and sessions about uh, hardware hacking. Uh, we've got the exhibition, which is going to have stands from Liverpool Lug, Bristol Lug, Bite Mark, Anonymous, O'Reilly. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> uh, Free Software Foundation Europe, Open Suze, the Open Rights Group, and Hacker Public Radio. Cool. Okay. That's all, you know, fine. But tell us about the things that people really care about, the social aspects. Of course. We know that geeks love to socialise. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we, right. We're going to have drinks on Friday night. So that's the Friday cool. night before the event, if you're coming up early. Um, Dan says there is a bar underneath the hotel. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, of course there is. <laughs> Called something like The Wave. So that's where we're probably going to... That's just a public bar. That's probably where we're going to be on the Friday night. Uh, we'll make Do, sure that we get firm details on the website. Are we going to warn them that there may be a sort of dissent of geeks into I believe, the I believe they've underground been forewarned. Bar. They should get some drinks in or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two um, miniatures this week. <laughs> um... Uh, every each lunchtime we're going to be having a geek nick that's the bit that's sponsored by O'Reilly they're providing us with drinks and stuff cool um, so that's just going to be there's some grass outside the venue we're all going to go outside there weather permitting and have a picnic and a chat and I don't know throw some frisbees and whatever you do at a picnic um, and there's going to be a party on the Saturday night which is probably going to be at the hotel in the bar okay sounds good sounds think, excellent uh, you've probably got the, the best speaker list of any unconference ever yeah, yes. it's quite good, isn't it? <laughs> That's really good. And Mark's done a lot of the work on that, so so kudos to you, Mark. Thank you. Um, and I know I'll I, take all the credit. No, yeah. no, but you know you've done a lot of the a lot of the work on the, on the speakers. Uh, Andy Piper is going along. He's going to be there. I so will if, be on the crew with we, uh, uh, with with of course the legendary Les Pounder as our as our glorious leader, <laughs> Les Quarter <laughs> Pounder as. as <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's what he calls himself. That's what yeah, he used yeah. to be known as Quarter Pounder okay. on, on well, the internet. Well, all I, I, I just call him the Chief. Okay, it's cool, sir. Yeah, and uh, Mark and, and I are going as well. Laura and Alan, and uh, I know this Alan isn't going, but uh, there'll be lots of other people there as well. So it sounds like it's going to be a really. Alan good Bell weekend. gets a year off after his sterling work with the videos last year. Yes. So if you still haven't got your act together, there are some tickets available still, I believe. <laughs> um, a handful, I believe so. Yeah. Dwindling amounts. Yes. So, so get in there quick, um, and yes, find yourself some accommodation. I think the official hotel is probably gone by now, but it's still worth trying. Yep. Um, and yeah, have a good time. Check it out at oldcamp.org. Andy? And yeah, so for events that um, it's too late to get involved in, unfortunately, but I just wanted to mention that next week is Young Rewired State 2012, which um, I'm involved in. I'm going to be mentoring um, a group of students actually in uh, Guildford in Surrey. There's So Young Rewired State is a, a fantastic event that's been started by Emma Mulqueenie. And uh, the goal every year is we get a bunch of students in centres around the UK to uh, learn coding. So from ages about 8 to 18, quite kind of a challenging age range. Um, we use open mm. data and build kind of social good apps and uh, mm. looking forward to it. And hopefully there'll be plenty uh, of output online for you to follow next week on Twitter and, uh, and follow on the website as well. Cool. Cool. And that's all the events. And welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners wherever you are around the British Empire, or indeed the Isle of Dogs, where one day they hope to build an Olympic park. Good luck with that one. That will be our delightful co-host, Miss Deirdre Morris Oxford. A Good day, Deirdre. Good day, Douglas. And today's topic is terribly exciting. Teleportation. That's the instantaneous mode of travel by means of molecular decomposition, transmission, and reassembly. You're reading that from a card. Yes, but this time I understand it. A tele from the Greek meaning travel, and porte from the French meaning, uh, travel. If you understood it, Douglas, you'd know that teleportation is impossible. Uh, not according to Nikola Tesla, Deirdre. Tesla was a fruitcake, Douglas. Haven't you heard of the work of Professor Karl Heisenberg, The Uncertainty Principle? I'm not sure. Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle states that it is impossible simultaneously to know the position and momentum of an atomic particle. Surely all you need is a very, very small hoover to suck them all up. Give me strength. There are trillions of atomic particles in everyday objects that can't be plotted. You can't break them down and reassemble them. Haven't you heard of Schrodinger's cat, the Copenhagen interpretation? Oh, Schrodinger, the moggy murderer, diabolical mechanism, cat locked in a box, poisoned. Yes, I wrote to the animal cruelty people about him. I don't see what a poisoned pussy has to do with teleportation, Deirdre. After all, if you want to send a cat somewhere, you send a boy around with it on a bicycle. According to Schrodinger, the Copenhagen interpretation implies that the cat remains both alive and dead until the box is opened. Nonsense, Deirdre. Just give the box a jolly good shake. You'll soon find out. The box is impenetrable. I'll say. Cats and geig counters and radioactive particles, indeed. But what's wrong with keeping it in a wicker basket? 
Never mind the box, it's a theoretical model. Oh, it's a stuffed cat, I see. No, I don't. Why would you poison a stuffed cat? Ugh. You see, Deirdre, all this talk of stuffed cats, and now we've run out of time. Uh, that's all for tomorrow's technology today. Toodle Pip and God Save the King. We're joined now by Jonathan Nadu from the Accessible Computing Foundation. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for joining us. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Uh, now, I understand the Accessible Computing Foundation is quite a new organisation, so do you just want to start by telling us a bit about um, what you are and uh, why you have just formed? Oh, sure. So, well, the uh, Accessible Computing Foundation is a 51C3 nonprofit organisation. We just got our nonprofit status. and I'm a blind GNU Linux user, and I'm the executive director, and basically the foundation is dedicated to bridging the gap between accessibility and technology through free and open source software. Cool. Okay. Um, so what, uh, what are your sort of main goals um, as a foundation? Well, uh, I mean, uh, you, you guys are, I'm sure, are aware that this day and age technology is moving at such a rapid rate, and as fast as technology moving is moving, uh, accessibility is being left behind as fast as technology is moving. So the foundation is the goal is to step in and, like I said, bridge that gap between accessibility and technology. So what we want to do is create accessible software, free open source software, to you know to work better on mobile phones or tablets or you know uh, working within the GNU Linux operating system and and making that run better. Um, like, like, I, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm blind to Linux user. We're not focusing on just blind and low vision accessibility. We're trying to cover uh, every accessible uh, avenue that we need to look at. There's uh, roughly one billion people in the world with some type of disability. So we want to go after people that are paraplegics, quadriplegics, uh, hearing impaired, uh, vision, low vision, uh, learning disabilities, dyslexic. We want to cover all of these avenues using um, accessible software to, again, bridge the gap between accessibility and technology. So on the technology side, um, so, so what, what sort of projects in particular do you want to um, do you want the organization to be contributing towards? Is, is it focusing on the GNOME or um, desktop Linux or, or, or any particular mobile flavor? Uh, well, there's some of the things we're looking at doing is kind of looking at some of the low-hanging fruit right now. There's you know, quite a few accessibility bugs on Bugzilla pertain to, you know, the GNOME desktop, Orca, um, you know, maybe Pigeon, whatever kind of low-hanging fruit there is right now, we're going to be um, taking some of the money that we raised from our fundraiser and paying some developers to start squashing some of the low-hanging fruit and, you know, uh, start moving on that front with the GNU Linux desktop and maybe getting uh, Orca to work better within the XFC desktop as of uh, XFC 4.10. They made, uh, they're making strides for that desktop to become more accessible with Orca. KDE is also working on the QT framework being accessible with Orca. So we'd like to move forward on, you know, Orca or great coming into those other desktops other than GNOME and uh, giving, you know, blind and low vision users more of a choice between desktops to use. And um, there's also... The Simon Project, which is uh, part of KDE, that has a lot of uh, voice recognition stuff that's going on right now, and it looks like they could use a little bit of help, too, getting some stuff off the ground. So we'll be focusing on things like that. And uh, like I said, we're looking at some low-hanging fruit first just to be effective and show people that, you know, we're motivated into, uh, into doing what we're saying we're doing. Then, you know, once we gain momentum, we can start tackling bigger projects. So is the goal of the foundation then to actually start to contribute code to these projects or is it to be a be a really a uh, an agitator to, to try and get other people involved or, or are you looking to uh, really um, drive the different uh, linux dis distributions to uh, include this stuff i mean what's how, how are you looking to engage with the community here uh, i guess from every angle 
you know, we possibly can, I guess, first and foremost, we're going to be advocates of, you know, accessibility uh, with free and open source software, but we'll also be taking money and paying developers to fix some of these bugs because, <clears throat> excuse me, unfortunately, you know, sometimes there might be bugs filed against, you know, some, some programs, and unfortunately, some, like the maintainers of those programs, accessibility kind of gets hooked under the rug sometimes, unfortunately, because to them, the software is running fine, even though the, the successful bug is filed against it. It, it works for them because they're not depending on the accessibility, which is, you know, understandable, but at the same time, it'd be nice if they could, you know, fix these bugs. But that's where we come in and we'll pay a developer, you know, uh, a certain amount of money to squash certain bugs, and then that way these bugs will get fixed. And then we'll also try to help uh, advocate and educate maybe some developers because, uh, 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 on like programming with accessibility in mind because really a lot of accessible stuff could be taken care of quite quickly if some developers were aware of um, accessibility practices when developing software and a lot of things could probably be taken care of right away if they were aware of these things from the beginning when they started developing software. So in terms of your plan for actually having people paying people to work um, on these bugs, um, I mean, do you have people sort of lined up who are ready to go and just need the money, or are you going to be putting up bounties for certain fixes? We have a couple people in mind, but we also would like to uh, broaden the horizon for developers and accessibility, because right now, developers within accessibility of like free and open source software are kind of few and far between, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to get more people, you know, working with, with on the Orca team right now. Joe Marie Diggs is the lead developer, and she really only really has like two or three other people really working with her with like within Orca. Like she, I put on a, a conference called the Northeast Gaming Linux Fest, and she gave a talk, and she was explaining that they have a real bad, you know, hit by the bus factor where, you know, if if someone something bad were to happen to someone within accessibility and, and like GNOME you know, and GNU Linux, uh, it would not be a good thing because there really isn't that many people working on this stuff. So we'd really like to get in some other developers and start, you know, paying for them to uh, to expand, you know, work of being worked on within, like I said, helping work within XFCE, KDE, uh, you know, things like that. So we're looking to pay currently, you know, developers already within these projects, but we're also looking to branch out and find other people to help these projects along. So tell, tell us a bit more about this event you've got coming up. Oh, sure. Uh, so, we, like I said, we got our 51C3 uh, status uh, recently. And so we are going to be having a fundraiser on August 25th, which is a Saturday. And it'll start on noon Eastern Standard Time and go until midnight. Essentially, it's going to be like a 12-hour podcast. We're going to be streaming it live on the new radio.net. And um, we'll be using uh, mobile for a voice over IP. And we're using the linuxbasics.com mobile server. But we can have up to 30 people in, in one room at once. And uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Jono Bacon on, which uh, I'm sure you guys uh, are acquainted with Jono. And uh, we're going to yes, have uh, Zach <laughs> Stefano Zaccaroli, the Debian project leader. Uh, they'll be on at separate times, but... They'll come in, and we're going to come in and have a discussion about accessibility, free software, you know, the importance of accessibility using free and open source software. And uh, like I said, there could be up to 30 people in the room, and those 30 people that might be in the room can, you know, talk to Jono and talk to Zach, and even, you know, even if they don't have necessarily accessibility questions, they can just ask, you know, them stuff about Ubuntu or Debian or, or whatever else the topics that might come up. And like I said, we're going to be doing it for 12 hours straight. I'm hoping to get, you know, a few other people on um, to, to give access to people that ask these uh, guys questions. But the goal is to hopefully have 1,000 bronze-level membership. So if you become a member of the Accessible Computing Foundation, a bronze-level membership is $2. And when you become a member at $2 a month, you will get your own freedommail.co email address at the benefit of being a member of the Accessible Community Foundation. So when you pay at least $2 a month, you'll have a freedommail.co email address, and you'll be able to use that, uh, you know, however you like. You'll be able to use IMAP or Prop3. It has a webmail client. You can access it with your mobile phone, through the web, or you can use an email client. However you wish, you'd have your own freedommail.co email address. 
when you become a member at two dollars a month, and you'd be supporting, you know, the Accessible Community Foundation and accessibility and free software, and bringing you know accessible freedom to people around the world by being a member. So we're trying to do that fundraiser. I'd really like to be able to have a thousand uh, two dollar members um, around this time of the fundraiser, and that would really help us get off the ground and you know start paying developers to uh, move forward and like I said, start squishing some of these bugs. So, does, so that'll be going on August 25th. So does this event uh, have a subscription fee to take part in it, or is it just something to raise the profile of the, the foundation and get people to uh, become members as a result? Exactly, yeah. Okay. This so you, event you, doesn't cost anything, but it's just to bring awareness to the foundation and to encourage people to become members. Okay, what if people want to pay to shut John O'Bacon up? Is that, <laughs> <laughs> is that possible? We are willing to take uh, all of those for <laughs> Okay. Um, and just for our, our international listeners, you talked earlier about a 501c3 status. Could you just explain yeah. a little bit what that is? Unfortunately, if you live out in the United States, it's not really going to uh, do much for you. It, it, it's a uh, tax deductible um, status that we have here in the United States. So if you, you know, donate like $500 a year, to uh, a nonprofit organization, you can use that as a tax write-off for your when you file your taxes. But outside of the country, unfortunately, that isn't of much use to anybody. You talked before about there being, uh, I think, a billion people in the world with, with some sort of disability that means that they could benefit from accessibility software in uh, well, in whatever op- operating system they use. Why do you think that accessibility is such a poor state in Ubuntu and other free software operating systems? important things of the, of the foundation is to bring, is to be an advocate of accessibility. And unfortunately, even I myself, I wasn't born blind. I was in a car accident at the age of 14, which uh, I lost, that's how I lost my sight. Um, if you don't depend on accessibility, it's easy not to think about it. it you know, it's sort of an out of sight, out of mind thing. And, it, you know, it's, it's not to of anyone's fault. It's just if you don't depend on it, you don't think about it, you don't realize it. And I've even spoken with some people that, you know, don't depend on accessibility and they say, you know, oh, I'm going to get involved and, you know, I'm going to start using Orca every day. And I now I touch base with these people and they say, oh, you know what, I, I really been slacking off in that area. I, I know I haven't used Orca in like a three weeks. So, you know, I, 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 I had a friend that started using it, Orca for 15 minutes a day, even though he could, he could see totally fine. But, after, you know, after a week or two or a month of doing it, he just started, you know, slipping and he started, uh, you know, not using it as much as he was just to get used to it. And, you know, just an unfortunate thing, I don't hold anyone accountable for it, but it's just, like I said, if you don't depend on it, you just don't think about it. And that's why, you know, the foundation is, is starting up is to bring awareness to the needs of these people because a lot of people that do depend on accessibility, they just think, well, there's nothing I can do, and they just sit back and they use whatever is available, even if it doesn't work 100%. They just say, well, this is how it is, and they live with it, and they don't think it can be better. They don't think changes can be made, and that's why, again, you know, we're, we're going to be advocates of accessibility and free open source software. So is there anything you can do other than just making a lot of noise and, and just trying to get the message out there about accessibility being important? Um, well, I, honestly, I really think that you know, more people that do depend on accessibility, I mean, even a few people can make a difference. I mean, all it takes is you know, filing some bugs, following up with the developer, saying, like, you know, maybe explain to them why fixing bug XYZ is important to them and what kind of a difference it can make in their life. You know, developers want people to use their software. And, you know, I, I've had a few occasions where I've reached out to some developers, and even they themselves have said, you know what, I, I've never thought of this. I'm glad you brought it to my attention, and I'm going to fix this problem. So, the developers want you to use their software, and you know not all the developers would react that way, but quite a few do. So all it takes is just a few people to be able, to, you know, slightly motivated and reach out to these developers, hop onto the mailing list, file some bugs, and I mean, that, really, that's how it, the difference can start to be made even there. If we've got listeners who are eager to help out and and join the cause, what can they do to get involved? Uh, definitely go to accessiblecomputingfoundation.org, and uh, there's, there's a contact info right there. Uh, you can get a hold of me. 
Um, I'm also, we're also trying to build a community, actually. Uh, if you go to accessiblefreedom.org, and we're trying to build a community of people that depend on accessibility there, um, we have a free voice over IP chat room that anyone can log in and use. There's all the information is on accessiblefreedom.org. And on Monday nights right now, we have meetings of where, you know, right now it's just blind individuals getting together at 8 o'clock on Monday nights, Eastern Standard Time, and we're just hanging out talking about GNU Linux free software, what distributions we're using, uh, why we're using them, what's accessible, what is, and, you know, when we're trying on alpha versions of newer operating systems coming out. So if, uh, if anyone's interested, you can definitely go to accessiblefreedom.org also and check that out. We're trying to build a community there. We also have a, a web chat client for hearing impaired people if they want to use that because, you know, obviously they're not going to use a voice over IP chat. Um, so, yeah, if you, if you want to go there, you can check out AccessibleFreedom.org. You can also check out AccessibleCompetingFoundation.org. Um, at this moment, I don't have anything posted about the event, but there will be within the next week all the information about the August 25th event will be on there. And, uh, yeah, so you'll be able to find everything between those two websites. Okay, brilliant. Well, uh, we're going to have to leave it there, but thanks very much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you, guys. And best of luck with your event. Indeed, you have to Thank send you. us an email and tell us how it went. Absolutely. Thank you guys for all your help. Right. Okay. Cheers yourself. then, Jonathan. Thanks very much. Bye. 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 And now, the bit about Ubuntu, or Ecosphere, or... Whatever. Gerald. Gerald. Yeah, that one. Hmm. So uh, this uh, recently we've had Alpha 1 of Ubuntu. Alpha 3. Doing well here, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Alpha 3 of the Quantal Quetzal uh, has been released. So that's, okay. this is the, the new version of Ubuntu and the... Uh, 12.10. The, the 12.10, yes. The third snapshot of it that's been uh, unleashed upon uh, the ego world. Will this be the last Alpha before it goes to beta? Does anybody know? I, I, no, I, I, I don't know. Think canonical, so. So unfortunately, <laughs> get somebody like Hopian. Um, I, I shall check. So, so what they've done okay. is um, they've updated a bunch of packages. They've upgraded the latest kernel. Um, so a couple of things that are worth noting if you're into Ubuntu and you're into development. They're not shipping Python less than 3 by default um, anymore. So if you want right. it, you can still get it. But, but Python 3 is the default in, in 12.10. Um, and they've made a few changes to the way that the server images are packaged. Um, yes, they're, they're not going to do a an i386 CD anymore. That's right. They're not apparently going to do an ISO image for um, the server for i386. If you want it, you can still get the minimal in, the netboot kind of image and right. install it off the network. But oh, right. you can still the default is going to be the 64 bit installer, which will come as an image. And you'll be able to upgrade an i386 server that you've got kicking around. Uh, yeah, because so, that's going to be off the network. So, I'm the assuming the so, still there. It's yeah. just, mm -hmm. just no, not burning an image. And any server in the last five years is 64 bit anyway. Or ARM. Oh. Well, <laughs> people have servers, home servers, running on yeah old bits of junk. Yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm pretty sure even anything they've even a home server that's been bought new in the last five years will be capable of running 64. Well, it depends. I mean, if it's an old netbook or something like that, why are you running something with server a broken screen? But yeah, um, but why not? Yeah. No, yeah. you're yeah. right. It's you possible. Can. possible. Yeah. <laughs> but but those should... lucky people will be able to get a net install. Or oh, they yeah. could just get Debian. Oh no, sorry, Ubuntu. That's what we're here for. I remember mm, now. That's right. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Anything else in Alpha Three that's uh, worthy of note? Well, there's new new LibreOffice with a, a a nice new green splash screen. Wow! Ooh. Sign me up. Yeah, they've, they've, <laughs> they've upgraded. They've upgraded. Uh, it's kind of a, it's as you'd expect from a, an interim release in Alpha. They've they've yeah. upgraded things like um, X to and, and GNOME components to the newest versions to make sure that they can give them a good testing before they go live in twelve ten. Cool. Okay, so people can download the ISO and try it out and file bugs, feedback stuff. And hope nothing breaks. <laughs> I, I'm using it on a daily basis now. Okay. Are you using it now? I'm using it now, yeah. Okay. It works fine. We can still hear you. <laughs> <laughs> also in the bit, uh, web apps launched, as we mentioned earlier. Yeah. We talked about the uh, the OSCON announcement of the web apps, which aren't just shortcuts to websites. They no. actually integrate with the OS. Yes. Very exciting. Very nice. Um, yes. And we also heard um, that Didier Roche has put out a call for help with Quickly, who wants to reboot the project. So Quickly is a sort of, uh, I'm, I'm 
hesitant to say Ruby on Rails for the desktop, but basically a framework <laughs> for quickly building applications which can be easily packaged. The clue's in the name, really, isn't yes. it? <laughs> oh, quickly, yes. And uh, Michael Hall has been doing some pretty awesome stuff around quickly and building a a, a GTK Ubuntu front end for quickly, and he's built it in quickly. <laughs> Sounds self hosting. It is yes. self hosting. It's it's, it's it's very cool actually. It tells you um, it automatically detects what project you're on. Um, if you could just go to the Launchpad w- website and go to a web page about your project, it'll switch that to your default project. And then if you want to run it, mm. it, it just knows what project you're thinking about. It's very cool. Yeah. Okay, so why does it need rebooting? I guess it's gone a bit stale i don't really know i've not Hold a minute. This, was, this was just to remind me this was tony's news item right <laughs> <laughs> well I, i'm happy to be able to say that uh, one of the reasons to do it is to port it to python 3 oh very good ah. which obviously is a requirement given that they've taken python 2 out of ubuntu right so uh, well, they haven't taken it out it's just not going to be default yeah exactly so uh, therefore it would not be sensible they to ship to, it want to reduce dependencies on yeah. python 2, yeah so. exactly and you know it was one of these projects that evolved rather than was designed from scratch. So I imagine there's a lot of kludges and an old code they want to refactor and get rid of. There is bacon code in there. <laughs> Start with that. Start with I, that. I think this is one of the things that, that, that one of the many projects that, that emerged out of Jono being on a long plane ride. Yeah. Plane trip. Yeah. So you're saying that Jono hacked some code together, threw it over the wall and relied on other people. No, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> You'd never do that. No, no. Couldn't uh, possibly comment. So George Castro, uh, the community, one of the community leads around Ubuntu, has a uh, blog to say that the Ubuntu forums needs uh, some single sign-on help again. So what happened here was that uh, the Ubuntu forums apparently are based on um, a PHP uh, application called vBulletin. Mm-hmm. And uh, in order to make it work with the uh, OpenID uh, stuff that, uh, or single sign-on stuff that the uh, rest of Ubuntu works with, um, they needed to do some hacking. And apparently the previous version was kind of version based on vBulletin 3 and it was kind of hacked together and they're looking for someone to help them get it working on vBulletin version 4 and they've open sourced the code and you can get it on Launchpad. Cool. And uh, not about Ubuntu. Yes. The maintainer of several known based projects whose name escapes me. Oh, I had it a moment ago. It's Benjamin, Benjamin Ott. Uh, has written a blog post asking if GNOME has lost its way. And has it? That's for you to decide. <laughs> well, what, it, well, part, part of the, um, the, the commentary that he made is that GNOME is now basically a Red Hat project, which is mm, something yeah. I've heard from a number of people, uh, most of those people who are working at Canonical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hmm. do, they mean, do they mean the from GNOME Mark desktop? Demons. Or do they mean GNOME all... Cause, cause they, as, mean, as, they mean GNOME the project, and the direction and governance of the project is done at the water cooler inside of Red Hat Towers. Because a lot of the GNOME components are used, or you know, the, the libraries and so on are obviously used heavily in Unity, mm. the desktop. Mm. And a lot, yes. of, a lot of the applications that aren't the desktop environment. Right. Yeah. So Things GCAL like and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Which, of course, needs, brings us neatly on to another discussion, which is that Unity is apparently... Uh, now going to be available as an optional desktop on Federer. So there's an yeah, interesting set of yeah. things happening here. And, and and you kind of, to me, that whole discussion about GNOME as a project losing its way is not ne- not necessarily valid if you look at it as something that the, 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 the library is being used more widely. So, But I understand the general view, oh, gosh, maybe this is in control of one organization at this point. Yes, it seems slightly hypocritical to criticize uh, Red Hat, if they are essentially governing the direction of GNOME, and in the same way that Cano- uh, yeah, and, co- and contributing to it in the same way that Canonical contributes to Ubuntu and largely govern its direction. But then Canonical did start Ubuntu and Unity, whereas I yes, Red Hat sort of just make a lot of money out but of it, GNOME. But it's the same as anything. If there are people interested and want to get involved, then yeah. they can have a say in the governance and what happens. If nobody cares, and Red Hat are the only people there you know, paying any attention to so it, then put up or shut up. Exactly. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note from John major, um, <laughs> that's the end of the not about and bit about Ubuntu this time. <laughs> it's, 
It's time for your feedback, and we've had a lot of lovely emails since the last episode, and we start with this one from Marcel LaRue. For those of your listeners who would like to try Ubuntu again, but without Unity, please read my new post, Ubuntu 1204, the way most of us want it. And there's a, a link to a Reddit article. And uh, Popey's left us a note here saying, note how it has no upvotes on Reddit yet, but, uh, but claims that most of us um, want it this way. And... You are, dear listeners, can fix that. So go to this link and, and upvote it to prove, prove Popey, Popey wrong. wrong. <laughs> if Blame indeed, Popey. that is the way most of us want it. Yes. Worth, worth you know, we're saying there's the freedom and flexibility it, to be able to change it. It's an interesting article. Stop, so. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Maybe not quite as many people want, or are that fussed about it as, as some people might think, though. Mm. Dean from Australia wrote to say... I just listened to the most recent podcast and your roundtable had a discussion regarding the Steam client for Linux. Anyway, Richard Stallman has recently voiced his opinions on it. I find Stallman's response a little hypocritical. First and foremost, isn't freedom about choice? People can complain about the non-free element of Steam, but realistically it's up to the user if they want to install it or not. If they don't like it, don't install it. The thing mm. about Richard Stallman is that when he uses the word freedom, he talks about not freedom as in having the choice to do what you want. He thinks about freedom as in not being oppressed, as he sees it, yes. which a lot of people... Yeah, I'd miss and free therefore... as in speech, not free as in beer. Yeah, no, that's or free that as in that's a different or, kind or of free as in a choice of beers. <laughs> free as in oh dear, this this is getting too confusing. So I, I think that the the point that um, Dean from Australia makes, the saying that first and foremost isn't freedom about choice. Well, Stallman would disagree with you, and yes. he's <laughs> he 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 is a bit of um bit of a character, shall we say. But he's extremely consistent in his views. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So he, he he's 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 tend, tends not to be hypocritical. He he doesn't contradict himself, but um, but he's a nutter. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as we mentioned earlier, he does actually acknowledge that it might be useful to get people to move to Linux using proprietary games as, yeah. as the bridgehead to, to get them across. So if that, in some ways, is a slight softening of of some of his uh, previous position. So interesting be, to see. Yeah. And talking of contradictions. Uh, on, on the same subject, David Carson emailed. While I could see both sides of the argument, I think that Alan nailed it when he pointed out that nobody is forcing anyone to install proprietary software on their systems. We can choose to install it or choose to stay open source. Also, I think that Tony contradicted himself <laughs> when he said that we shouldn't allow makers of proprietary software to dictate how we do things in open source. He then stated that Linux does not have an office suite compar comparable or compatible with Microsoft's offering. I didn't think that the aim of open source software developers was to mimic the functionality of proprietary applications, but to innovate and forge a different path. If they are doing that, then surely makers of proprietary software are already dictating how we do things. Can I can I just point out, actually, on, on the back of that comment, that one of the things that Mark Shuttleworth talks about at, at uh, OSCON was exactly that, that um, he and the Ubuntu project and the, the team at, at Canonical really feel strongly that they want to not be copying OS 10 and, and Windows, but really to leapfrog all of these other guys. Um, mm. So that's that's a really good point. However, you know, my my own opinion is unless you have those basic things that people expect from an operating system, or let's just say a computing device, because people don't think about operating systems, they just think about this device. Does it let me send my email? Does it let me access my web apps? Unless those things like Office Suites are there, then uh, and they are they don't have to be absolutely the same, but they are broadly consistent or understandable, then you mm. don't get that fine. So I think it's a bit disingenuous at this stage to say that there is no office suite. And yeah, I, I think the point I think the point I made was about <laughs> compatibility <laughs> with some of the more advanced features, and and that was really the split that I was saying. It's not that we should absolutely ape a, a copy of Office two thousand and three or two thousand and seven or whatever within Linux. We should have the innovation and the uh, the different paths being forged that we took, that the, uh, the correspondent talks about in this email, um, but we need to have the compatibility to work with other people who are using that software. Otherwise it, it, it does shut out swathes of you know, business users or whatever. Well, you know, it if denies you can't... them their choice as well, actually. If, if you're saying you have to use the same suite as me because I'm open source and mine's not compatible with yours, so you should all come over to my side. Yeah. It's actually denying them their choice as well. So Absolutely. Do, do what you like with the UI. Just make sure you can open and save the files. Cree Trapper left us a message on the website saying... I enjoy your show very much, especially all the little quips and asides. Thank you. I never had as much fun with voucher code as in the most recent episode of UUPC. Keep up the great work. 
You see, guys, I said we should have done the voucher we, code. We are known week. for our fun with voucher codes. Yes. <laughs> That's what they put on iTunes reviews. <laughs> Stefan Haslinger has sent us this missive. It's always good fun to listen to your show. I think a podcast is a, su- is a success if, as a listener, you have got the feeling that you're sitting in the room next to the presenters having a good time. Where is he? Hold on. I'm looking around the, <laughs> around the room. Is he having a good time or the presenter's having a it's good time? The hat. And, this, and this is always the case with your podcast. It could be a bit more in-depth, but presumably I'm not the average Ubuntu user. I wonder if we've ever met an average Ubuntu user. <laughs> There's no such thing, I'm sure. Thank in, you very much for that, Stefan. In the last show, you were searching for a fill-in for missing presenters. Ooh, ooh, that would be me. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that my English Battles. is good enough for such a task, but I think it would be okay for some chatting about software development on Ubuntu, if you like. Unfortunately, I cannot come over to neither Studio A or B because I'm located in Vienna, Austria. Well, Stefan, thank you very much to do for your offer. Um, it's clearly you're not trying hard enough to, uh, <laughs> to get to the studios. Um, fortunately, we're able to, uh, I was going to say, scrape the barrel and get two uh, guest presenters. <laughs> but two excellent guest presenters were available who did actually live a little bit more locally. Um, but thank you very much to do for your Unfortunately, they couldn't come either, so they got us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. And, uh, but yes, so thank you, Stefan. And that's the end of your feedback. <laughs> And that's all for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, which is podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. I think we might even be on Google+. Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. And join us on Tuesday the 14th of August for our next live episode. And I may be here if I can persuade Alan or Laura not to be. <laughs> 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 yes, well, if the uh, Mount Yifakafakafakal volcano goes off and Laura gets stuck in America, then, you know, we might be uh, calling on you again. Um, but yeah, so this will be the last episode before Og Camp, won't it, the next episode? Will, that one will be, yes. Yeah, and then the one after that will be the live episode from Og Camp. So we get a few <laughs> They always off. go well. Yes, we've got something very special planned for that. Oh, oh dear. Oh, there's a trailer. Well, thank you very much indeed to Alan and thank you to Andy for coming along and helping out. We do appreciate it. And uh, we'll hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you very much. Cheers then. Bye. Bye. Everybody. Bye.